to our discussion about indexes. Indexes are an integral part of how Splunk works. Uh, Splunk will ingest data and it will store that data inside indexes. As a, as a basic principle, it's going to take the uh, raw data you send into it, compress it, and store it inside the indexes in buckets based off time. And they use, uh, they'll use buckets at certain time windows and basically as Splunk searches, it's going to, you're going to send a search criteria using time. It'll look in that index over the, over the buckets that are included in that time window. That's the basic principle, the, the easy uh, version of what an index does. There are, you can run with the default index, you can create other indexes, and the question raises, so should I have lots of indexes, should I have few indexes, how, when should I create indexes? There's a few general principles, remember, the, that Splunk does have to, the bigger, more amount of data you stick into a single index, the longer it will take to search through it. Uh, there are a lot of things that it can use to speed that up, so that should not be the primary criteria for why you create an index. The, that's the first thing people will think is it's based off how much data is being ingested, but the real, the two big reasons Splunk will say this, and I, I say this because it really does makes it really does work in the real world, and if you're ever going to take any of the tests, make sure you understand this. The reason you build indexes is because you're using uh, role-based access control. So you want to restrict what data people can get to. So everything inside an index, if a user has access to one piece of the index, they have access to the in every bit of data inside that index. So if you want to exclude users from an index, you have to move that data into a different index. They can have, they either have all access to the index or no access to an index. So you build indexes based off uh, roles, such as a network administrator might have a set of data, a security admin might have a different set of data, and those would have different indexes if the two roles can't have certain sets of data. The other one is retention. Remember that you're, gonna, you're keeping these logs. There might be some regulatory reasons you're keeping logs, managerial reasons, whatever. Some logs you may want to keep for a long time and other logs you may want to keep for a short time. An index is going to, re, you're going to set a retention policy on the entire index. And so if the retention policy is 500 gigs, doesn't matter which, uh, uh, What's your retention policy is it's going to just start dumping stuff once it hits 500 gigs it's going to dump the oldest data it's not it's not going to make any decision say oh well this data is more important or not no treats all data in an index the same if you have a 365 day period everything's going to be saved for 365 so what you want to do when you decide about indexes is you sit down and you say all right who can have access to this can everyone have access to it all right no not everyone can have access to it okay well then let's make sure we put in an index that uh, fits their uh, access control. Do we have the same retention policy? You know what? We don't really care how long we keep this. A week is fine, but you have other data you want, got to keep for a year. Don't put those in the same index. Um, anyway, so that's the general principle behind indexes. Now let's discuss how to create an index. There's two ways. You can create an index from the command line, and that's usually we call it, you'll build an app, you'll, you'll send the uh, indexes you want, especially in a, a large environment. You might have um, deployment servers, you might have search head clusters, indexer clusters. You're going to want to create an app that you can push out all of your indexes to every machine. You'll do that through the command line. We're not going to discuss that. We're going to discuss the short and easy, simple way of doing it. You're just learning your Splunk. Um, go ahead and do it through the GUI. Um, just recognize that my environment here, my search head and my indexer are the exact same system. They are. I have a single instance Splunk. So thereby, when I create an index, my search head has access to it, and so does my index, indexer. Now many environments, they'll split the search head from the indexer. You build, you, if you're on the search head and you go in the method I'm going to show you with the GUI and you create an uh, index, it will only be available on the machine you created it. That means you'll have to build on the search head, then you'll need to go over to the indexer and create it there and all the different machines. That's why you end up building an app. So you build once, push, you, you risk, don't risk the uh, chance of messing things up. But while you're getting things going, while you're building a dev environment, it doesn't, it's sometimes just easier just to come in through the nice GUI here. And so I'll show you, you come to settings, under data, you go to indexes, and I'm going to go create me a new index. Here's all my existing indexes. I'm going to go create a new index and I'm going to call it 
blame YouTube. And we're going to talk about these. There are two types of indexes. There's event indexes. That's the default. That's what everyone's aware of. They're mo most likely, if you've been in Splunk, you've ever seen data, it's going to be an event type. There are metrics data. A lot of that is uh, t telemetry, but big big place you'll see it is if you're collecting Windows logs, um, syslog from your Linux OSs. So a lot of those OS logs, like, hey, I want to know what my CPU is, those will find themselves in a specialized index called metrics indexes. This is out of the scope of this meeting, out of this discussion, out of this YouTube video. But um, there are two types of indexes. And then you've got your home path, your cold path, and your thawed path. It shows you where that is going to go by default. As a general rule, I don't ever mess with that. If you need to change the location, well, there you go. Otherwise, just let it, let Splunk create these paths for you. Data integrity check, nice little feature. I don't find it that useful. Um, we have other methods of maintaining data integrity, but the concept here is Splunk's going to uh, compute hashes on your data and thereby can tell you whether or not you are starting, your data is corrupting or things like that. So if that's really important to you, go ahead and enable that. It does take a, uh, extra, a little bit extra space on your system on your disk partition and it's also going to take up a little processing so that it does come with a cost. Uh, max size of entire index. This is, I'm going to shrink this down to 50 gig. I don't want 500 gigs. This is the only method through the GUI that you have to, uh, to deal with retention. It would be nice if the GUI had something to do with time. It doesn't. You want to deal with time, you're going to have to go into the, uh, the command line interface and modify the uh, indexes.com file yourself. And there will be another video outlining how to do that. But for from the GUI perspective, you're just going to choose the size. This is, a, this is actually a pretty simple method because you can just at the end of the day you come to your indexes here you compute up how much uh, you've allocated and just make sure that the total amount of uh, gigabytes terabytes whatever you've uh, which by the way you have options megabytes gigabytes terabytes uh, how much you've allocated make sure it does not exceed the partition on your machine if you run out of disk space, bad things happen. Uh, Linux crashes, Windows crashes, they not doesn't matter what your OS is, they don't like running out of space. So make sure as you're planning your indexes that you have enough space for your indexes to continue to grow and that they won't exceed the size of the partition you have. Um, so I'm going to do 50 there. Max size of hot, warm bucket, uh, cold buckets. Basically, I said when Splunk starts logging stuff, they're going to put them in these buckets and you'll have uh, it will set up how many buckets you have it open at any one given time as it writes things in it's it's very technical but the point is as a general rule if you have high volume indexes stuff that's creating uh, gigs of data a day I would tell you that that qualifies as high volume uh, there it's kind of a uh, arbitrary decision but I would say if you're creating a couple uh, couple gigs a day, you probably are high volume. You might be high volume if you're creating less, but the concept of a high volume also is lots and lots of little tiny files. Network traffic is a perfect example of a high volume. Little, little network connections, they're going to they're gonna fire off all the time. It's good to use this instead of using auto, write in auto high volume. What you'll find is that your indexes, your searches will be performed a little bit faster because it does a little better job of creating your uh, buckets. Again, if you don't mess, if you leave it as auto, you'll be fine. It's just one of those uh, fine tuning things you can do down the road if you're having problems with a little bit of speed. Find some of your high volume indexes and change it from auto to auto high volume. Uh, frozen path, if you're freezing off your data, you'll want to set that. Um, then choose the app you want to write it to. This is important if you don't, um, because when you're trying to find the indexes.com file, it can be written anywhere based off of which app you choose. I'm going to put mine in Lame EDU. That way I can go into the command line interface and show you real quickly what I've done. Um, I'm going to, I can choose to enable or disable reduction on the TSIDX. That is the metadata and search information about your raw data. Um, I would just leave it alone. There are, there are, I mean, if you, there are reasons to do it, but that is well outside the scope of this tutorial. So anyway, uh, just basically all I did that, that's really essential is name your index, make sure your size is what you want it to be, and pick the app you want to go into. Maybe change your auto high volume, and then hit save. Now, if I go look at my indexes, if I type lame. 
I can see, oh, look, there's my lame YouTube. I can edit it. So if I want to change into the settings later, I'm not locked in. I can change them. I can delete the index. I can disable the index. I can see that it's an event uh, index. If it was a metric, it would say metric. I can see what app it resides in. What's its current size? One meg is the minimum size. It won't, uh, it won't get any smaller. And you can see that event counts of zero. I have 50 gigs worth of storage. I don't have an earliest event. I don't have a latest event. And here's your home path frozen path status. Anyway, that is the general principle. I've shown you how to create it. Now let's talk about, I, I'm, and in here, we set the retention policy. Now let's talk about access control. If I come into roles, access control is done at the role level. I'm going to come down to user, and this third option here, I can actually choose indexes. Here's a list of all my indexes, and you'll see there's the lame YouTube. By default, it's included. They can go, a user can visit this. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to turn off all non-internal indexes. That's the, that is the default rule, is that all non underscore indexes are available to the user group. Pretty much everyone's a user, which means the minute you build an index, anyone can view it. I can, if I turn that off, I can manually say, yes, you can have the lame YouTube, you can have the lame training, you can have the lame test, but you can't have anything else. Stuff like that. So here's how you do access control. I'm going to turn it back on because I don't have a reason to deny that. But there are, re and in a fully pro production environment, you might want to create a role, inherit those roles, uh, inheriting roles and all that's outside of the scope again of this YouTube video. I will definitely do a video on that. But anyway, so that's how you do, you manage index access control. Now let's go to the command line interface. I'm here in my Etsy opt Splunk lame training local. If I do an LS, I can see that there is a indexes.conf file there. If you have not built an index in your app, there will not be an indexes.conf file. But in my case, we just created it. And we can see, oh, look, there it is, lame YouTube. That's the name that I created. Here's those default cold home and thawed path. Max total database size, 512. That should equate to 500 gig. Uh, enabling TSIDX reduction, I said no. Enabling data integrity control, I said no. And that reflects that. And so there is the code that was created. If I want to create this YouTube um, index and now make it so that it's available to other places, I can I can take this indexes.conf file, put it in a custom app, and send it out. And I will definitely be discussing that in my next video on indexes. But basically, here's a this basic building block for building your index. If you need to modify it from the back the back end command line. Anyway, I hope this was helpful. If it was please give me a big thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel if you find this information useful. Um, and I hope this helps you on your journey from being a lame analyst to a Splunk Ninja.